So my name is Melanie Dizon. I'm the Director of Education and Research at the Davis Finney Foundation, and welcome to our monthly YOPD Women's Council. I'm so glad that all of you are here to join us. Uh, we have a really exciting, interesting session today. We're going to be talking about hormones and um, lots of uh, lots of different topics. Um, and we have a special guest here today. We're going to introduce her. I will pass this over to Gaynor right now. Take it away. Hello, thank you for joining us, everyone. Uh, we are delighted to have Dr. Karen. We have two Karens on the panel, so we are going to separate them as Dr. Karen. And I'm sorry, Karen, we're just calling you Karen. Is that all right? <laughs> Um, this, uh, there's so many issues, all of us are very much aware from a very personal point of view about the issues that there are um, at a certain time of life in particular, or as you approach a certain time of life perhaps, um, but, but just generally menopause, um, how, whether it's, um, is it if you have particularly bad PMS symptoms that it gets worse when it's when you have Parkinson's? Do your drugs not work, or is it that the Parkinson's becomes worse? What is it? What is this? So this is what we're kind of going to be discussing. But Dr. Karen, would you like to introduce yourself and what you're working on at the moment? Um, uh, and I think, Mel, do we, do we need to go around the rest of the panel or, the, okay, if we start with Dr. Karen and then we'll, we'll do the rest of the panel as well. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm here in Cleveland, Ohio. So it's uh, two o'clock here for me. And uh, it's a real pleasure for me to come and join you uh, on the Davis Finney Foundation on this panel. Um, I uh, was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease 14 years ago at age 47. And um, as I was a physician practicing OBGYN at the time in Cleveland and um, was really scared by that diagnosis. You know, I had no idea. You'd think that I would have a leg up on knowing what was going on being a physician, but I really didn't. I didn't know anything about Parkinson's disease. I was just like the rest of you who just thought Parkinson's disease was an old man's disease. And I, when they told me, I thought, who gets Parkinson's disease in one arm at age 47? Well, you know, now I know that a lot of us, that's how we present with a one-sided tremor or pain or something like that. So I kept it secret for three years, didn't tell hardly anyone. And um, at some point I decided that I had become the patient with Parkinson's disease who happened to be a physician instead of the physician who happened to have Parkinson's disease. And that was you know, a, a real you know, eye-opener for me. And I decided that the stigma of Parkinson's disease was, was being perpetuated by my decision to keep it silent. Um, I, seeing that if I, kept my disease silent, then nobody would know I had it. But if, if I waited until I couldn't hide it anymore, then when I tell people I would be the instant Parkinson's patient who was symptomatic instead of the person who worked well and for many years as a surgeon um, with my disease um, in my treatments. Um, eventually I did feel like it was, I was having to take more medication just to work. So um, I retired uh, in 2013. In the meantime, I had become a Parkinson's advocate, realizing that there was a lot of people in my community who were just like me, who were being told very little about their disease and finding a resource that was in one place and easy to get to was difficult. Um, and so I pulled my resource, my talents with a couple of other people and five of us came together and we created a center called In Motion, which is a wellness center for Parkinson's people, for patients with Parkinson's and their care partners and families in Cleveland. Um, so I pivoted from a, 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 a fundraising um, uh, mantle that I'd been wearing. My husband and I, uh, after we di dis um, disclosed my Parkinson's disease, we created a foundation called Shaking with Laughter, which was an annual fundraising event uh, where over the course of six years, we um, had an event with comedians and jazz musicians and we raised money for the Fox Foundation. Uh, we raised a little bit over a million dollars. So I retired that mantle and then took on this mantle of in motion, which is, you know, I, I hope that if you're ever in Cleveland, you come by and visit us because it's an amazing place. And uh, our services are also offered um, online and they're all services are free. So we do a lot of fundraising to make sure that people with Parkinson's don't have any, um, any barriers to getting well and to being well every day. So that's where mo most of my focus is now is, is trying to make sure that um, Parkinson's community is getting the resources that they need. Thank you, Sonia, do you wanna go next? 
Sure. My name is Sonia Mather. I'm a family physician and Parkinson's patient having been diagnosed over, I think, 22 years now. Um, I have the pleasure of being on the board of directors for the Davis Finney Foundation, as well as working with Karen at the Fox Foundation and a number of other areas. And Karen is not only a good friend, but she's definitely a force to be reckoned with. And I'm so pleased that she's been able to join us today. Thank you. The other Karen, another force to be reckoned with. Hi, good morning. It's nice to be here and nice to meet you, Karen. Dr. Karen, I am Nurse Karen. I'm a retired nurse anesthetist. I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease at 47 years old, which was three years ago. And at that time, I was having some challenges with my thinking and decided to uh, retire from my career, which I love very much. Um, now I do a lot of volunteer work. I uh, enjoy being ambassador for the Davis Finney Foundation and uh, I'm really uh, honored to be a part of this women's panel to address and highlight issues that are relevant to women with Parkinson's disease. Thank you. A lovely cat. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Kat Hill. I'm from Portland, Oregon. Um, I, too, was diagnosed in my uh, 40s at 48. I was a, uh, the director of a busy midwifery service in an inner city hospital in Portland. And I, too, left my career. Um, like Karen, I was having trouble multitasking with multiple patients. And um, I have now shifted gears in act two to be an advocate and a writer and a Davis Finney ambassador and um, am trying to centralize a little bit of information for women in a women's Parkinson's project online, um, an international blog that we're trying to get launched here. And I'm really honored to be a part of this panel. So thanks for having me. Lovely. I'm Gaynor. I was diagnosed at 42. Uh, I then launched a charity called Spotlight YOPD in the UK and I'm delighted to be um, involved with the Davis Finney Foundation uh, as a guest panellist or no I'm a regular panellist aren't I but guest because I'm from the other side of the ocean or whatever. Um, anyway Kat do us, do us how's your English accent coming along just really quickly because you like to do a hello love. Hello, love. You Very let good. Me know. Good work. It's coming along nicely. I'm pleased with that. Thank you. I'll let you in soon without, you know, your, yeah, passport. Well, actually, will anyone be allowed in anywhere, anywhere? Let's, let's move on from that. <laughs> um, so when, from my personal experience, very soon I realised the, the worst time of my Parkinson's month was time of the month. And it was kind of time of the month and then some. Um, and I tried desperately for years to get any kind of information, any kind of advice on this. You know, is there a gynecologist out there that understands Parkinson's, specifically YOPD? Um, Dr. Karen is absolutely right when she says, you know, the understanding, you know, no one thinks. You think this is an old man's disease. I shouldn't have this. So the likelihood of anyone having too much information on on periods, menstrual cycle, menopause, etc., pretty slim on the ground. So, Karen, what did you do? How did you how did you work this out? Did it did it just kind of how did it affect you, Dr. Karen? Sorry. Well, first of all, let me say that um, there isn't a gynecologist out there who can tell you anything about Parkinson's disease. Um, and so, and when I looked at when I and I'm going to also give you uh, the kudos that the 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 link that I found, the website that I found most helpful with the most, most information is called the European Parkinson's Disease Association, the EPDA. And they actually are trying to collect information and try to do some um, uh, social um, calling of information to try to see what people, what women are going through. And so I would recommend that, that people visit that site. Let me see if I it'll pull up on my computer. Um, it's the EPDA. I think Jackie, Jackie just pulled it up and Great. sent it in the link. And so they have a whole section on, on women's health um, and on menopause. And so I think that that's a good place to start for people. I don't know of any equivalent um, uh, informational site here in the United States, but that's the beauty of the internet is that you can go anywhere and look for it. Um, for me personally, I was on a birth control pill. I was done having my kids. And so I was on oral contraceptive medication when I went through menopause. So my menopause was very easy. 
I didn't really notice it. I was probably more concerned about my Parkinson's disease and, and certainly my, my, my neurologist knew nothing about women's health issues. So, um, but it's, so the, and the, the, the reality of our situation is, is that our, our, the years that we're getting diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, except for maybe Sonia, who was diagnosed much younger than the rest of us, are so close to being when we're gonna go through menopause. So it's really hard to distinguish, to differentiate what is menopausal and what would be additional in, you know, additional problems as a result of your Parkinson's disease and vice versa. Um, so I would probably say, as we say about Parkinson's disease that everybody has their own story. I assume that it would probably be very similar when it comes to going through menopause, what, um, what your symptoms are. But Parkinson's is, you know, we deal with Parkinson's as a symptom related thing, problems. We look at the symptoms and we try to tackle each one of them. So depending on what somebody's issues are with going through menopause, they might have to tackle it differently than somebody else's issues. Um, so there's a lot of autonomic dysfunction that happens with Parkinson's disease, which, you know, kind of sort of those same things, bladder issues and bowel issues and sweats and things like that and sleeping issues are all part of some women's menopausal story. So, um, I think that the, the safest thing to do is to think about it not as two different things, but as a symptom that you need to solve and, and, and to know that it could be coming from both, both of those um, diagnoses, menopausal and, um, and from Parkinson's. Does anyone want to chip in on this? I, uh, you know, please join in if you have personal Yeah, experience. I think, Dr. Karen, oh, sorry, Karen. Go ahead, Karen. Okay. You're muted. Um, so my, my story is pretty similar. You know, I, I, um, I had a diagnosis of anxiety, which predated my Parkinson's diagnosis, which also made it complex. So uh, uh, it, it was definitely exacerbated by my menstrual cycles and I was um, on a copper IUD. Um, so I didn't have the benefit sort of of hormones um, and I was still having regular cycles. I also, I think many women are juggling the sandwich generation issues, right? I was caring for a sick and dying mother and I have teenagers in the home. And so I didn't have a lot of bandwidth to be examining the the symptoms. So I, like a good healthcare provider, really ignored them for a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. and only looking backwards, could you only have known that your anxiety was a non-motor symptom of Parkinson's disease? Yes. There's no way anybody would have diagnosed you then. Right, right. Not in my 30s, for sure not. Not and, in and 40s I heard, or 50s. You know, I, I, yeah. Nobody yeah. presenting with anxiety is going to get diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Right, right. So, so looking back, I think, you know, we, we get the wisdom, but I, I think we're all one body, right? So no matter what you're calling it, if you're uncomfortable right. and not feeling well, advocate for yourself, do some research, talk to your providers, and, and they may not have the answers, but get, I would say, be a squeaky wheel and, and try to investigate it if you don't feel well, and you're not getting answers that are helping you feel better. So no matter what you package it as, if you're not sure. feeling well, try to pursue some solutions. It doesn't have to be a miserable process. There's treatment for perimenopausal symptoms, and there's, there's meds for Parkinson's. So I wish in retrospect that I would have um, done a little bit more investigating and uh, perhaps I could have uh, made the choice to work longer in retrospect. Who knows? You know, hindsight's always 20, 20. Um, but I think there aren't a lot of resources out there. Dr. Karen, I think you're absolutely right on. So let's- but These kind of sort of forums can really create, especially if we, you know, keep them, you know, available to people to look at, really do, in I think, give people um, information that they can't find elsewhere. Yeah, and also permission. I think we as women uh, deny our permission to bring things up sometimes. We don't want to be complaining. And, and I think we can advocate and be clear about ourselves and, and be the voice to find to help find solutions for ourselves too. I really want to encourage women to do that that are out there questioning where to go. That's my there was a report actually that came out recently which was um, highlighting the divide between the uh, male and female provision of healthcare. And I think people automatically think, well, women are across this, women look after themselves, but actually they don't. Women tend to look after their, their other halves more uh, to, the, uh, to the detriment of their own health often. 
So, I mean, I, I think there's, there's, there's something in there, which, which is what you said, Kat, you know, you, you kind of, as a good healthcare, um, you know, as a good nurse, you kind of put your own situation, you would, wouldn't introduce that as a topic, maybe. I think there's a lot of that, but also there's something about um, the, the stigma and keeping it quiet and not maybe feeling comfortable talking to a male neurologist about, you know, women's issues, perhaps, or certainly maybe that's, maybe that's an English thing. I don't know. No, I don't think that um, there's a lot of comfort level with the older male neurologists who dominate the field, you know, still yeah. um, have, and that they have a comfort level with those issues. I mean, and it's not just that. I mean, we have to deal with the whole issue of, you know, bladder issues and sexual intimacy issues. It's very difficult for them to, you know, when they started, I mean, many of the movement disorder specialists started their profession, the, the, those things weren't, you know, even on the table. They, I mean, so much was concentrated on motor symptoms and not, you know, pre-motor symptoms. So. Yeah, absolutely. Sonia, you must. Uh, I, I think Karen had her hand up actually. Oh, sorry, sorry, Karen. Um, yeah, I was gonna say uh, midlife as a time of getting diagnosed with Parkinson's disease as a woman, I think is sort of a big confusing picture. At least it was for me. I could relate to a lot of what Dr. Karen and Kat were saying. You know, I wasn't sleeping, uh, getting up to urinate like six, seven times a night, um, which preceded and severe anxiety and some issues with depression and weight gain. And I think that I was uh, a little bit confused used about what was causing what. And I would talk to one doctor about trying to figure out perimenopause. I hadn't had a period in a while. I had been taking a birth control pill for ovarian cysts. So I, I didn't know if I was in menopause. I thought I might be perimenopausal, but being on hormones, I wasn't sure. So after my diagnosis, I actually went off the hormones and uh, went through the process of being tested to see if I was perimenopausal. And in fact, I was heading into menopause. So now, three years later, I'm on hormone replacement therapy, which has helped my sleep tremendously. And, you know, I think also getting the proper medication and treating the symptoms, which were Parkinson's with dopamine-based therapies, the symptoms which may have been in an overlapping area with Parkinson's and uh, perimenopause with proper medications and stress management tools and other uh, things. But I think that you know, sexual issues um, around midlife uh, were an issue that I, did, I didn't know if that was related to uh, aging, change in my body image as I was, my body was changing and I, my libido had changed quite a bit. You know, I thought maybe it was depression or from the depression medications, uh, hormone related. I mean, it just was very complicated. It's taken years of sort of peeling away little pieces of it to narrow down what was causing what. And I can say three years later, I'm doing much better uh, just attacking these little issues one at a time with the help of different physicians from the gynecologist to the neurologist, to the internist, to you know, my psychiatrist. It was all one big team approach, I think. Karen, um, real quickly about your, your sleep. You had said that um, you weren't sleeping and then the HRT has helped you a lot with sleeping. How has that in turn helped you with your symptoms? Well, stress makes my symptoms so much worse and I didn't give enough uh, credit or that I'm, I'm having trouble finding the word, but I didn't realize how much a lack of sleep night after night after night after night was affecting my cognition was affecting my anxiety, was affecting how I felt, um, you know, insulin resistance and holding on to weight. There was just so much that was happening because of not sleeping. And, you know, getting my medications and starting the hormone replacement therapy was just phenomenal. I mean, I hadn't had a good night's sleep in years. And to have that back in my life just made a difference in my outlook, my mood, uh, physically my symptoms, um, less anxiety. There, it was a big in fact, that's probably the number one most helpful thing that I've done in the years since I was diagnosed is try to uh, have better sleep, whether that was through hormone replacement therapy or medications for Parkinson's. Estrogen's a wonderful thing. If we could give it to the whole world, they'd all be, they'd all be in a better place. <laughs> yeah, my experience was kind of through the whole gamut because I was pregnant with my first child when I was diagnosed. So I went through three pregnancies and then now going through perimenopause. So it's been, I would say the 
two times in my life where I've noticed my Parkinson's symptoms have gotten worse was during each pregnancy, although it did come back to a baseline after I delivered and perimenopause. Those are significant times. Around my cycle, I, I didn't notice it as much as say Gaynor was mentioning in terms of that one or two weeks where um, you know my hormones were changing and I was off more or that sort of thing. But particularly during the pregnancies and then perimenopause, have, I've noticed a noticeable change. Can you, can you talk a little, I know we have, uh, you know, young, young people that were your age, you know, having babies. Can you talk a little bit, like, what did it look like when uh, you were pregnant and it was, it was bad? Well, I, um, each, each pregnancy was different because each pregnancy happened, you know, later and later during the course of my illness. But, you know, the, I think for me, the issue was that I, I had opted not to take many medica much medication. Um, you know, I would, um, I was very limited in terms of what I could take because not a lot was known. I don't know how much is known now and Karen, no. Dr. Karen could <laughs> update us, but certainly at that time it was very, very different and, and people didn't want me taking medication. So my symptoms were worse because of that. Each pregnancy, each delivery was different. The first time no one paid much attention. The second time everybody who could ever be there in the room was in the room because someone with Parkinson's was delivering. And the third time it was back to nobody being there. So um, that was more of a reflection, I think, of people not knowing what to do with me than anything else. But um, but you know, it was it was a difficult time dealing with pregnancy symptoms as well as Parkinson's symptoms. But uh, as I said, once I delivered the baby and got back each of my daughters and got back on my medications, I didn't find myself any worse for wear. And I think that's experience of a lot of women um, as well from them that anecdotally that I've spoken with. I wonder if there's, um, there was, whether there is a, a, a confirmed correlation between um, birth control though, does that, has, is that the thing that's compensating with making the Parkinson symptoms worse if it's just time of the month, do we think? Well, the only, the only thing that I could find is that estrogen is, people who have a longer natural um, um, fertile lifespan from okay. when they start their periods to when they end their periods naturally, the longer that is, like if it's 39 years, so they have a, they have a much reduced rate of being diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So the shorter the estrogen period is, so if you go through a, a late um, menarche and an early menopause, so maybe you only have 33 years um, and less than four um, pregnancies, you have a much lower chance of, a much higher chance of having Parkinson's disease. So um, there's, been, there's been some research that's been done looking at estrogen in relationship to Alzheimer's disease as well. And so uh, there is not enough information for us to, for them to recommend hormone replacement therapy to treat Parkinson's disease cogn cognitive issues, but there certainly is data to suggest that it helps. And so if somebody is having Parkinson's, if somebody has Parkinson's disease and is having menopausal symptoms that can be treated with estrogen, there would be no reason unless they had a family history of breast cancer or something like that, not to try it because it'll probably help both things. It'll help their um, Parkinson's disease, their cognition, and, and also their menopausal symptoms. Um, and so the, the question is, is how long do we leave people on hormone replacement therapy? Um, and you know, there's, you know, when the Women's Health Initiative came out many years ago, there was this blanket statement to just take everybody off of it, which was ridiculous because you know, while you might not have any symptoms, your neighbor might. And so for us to ignore women's symptoms and, and it was, it was bad. So we, we had to take the individual and say, okay, what is their risk for, for taking, when taking hormone replacement therapy, you've got a person like Karen who's um, got Parkinson's disease and she's got menopausal symptoms that are keeping her from sleeping. That'll, you know, to be able to treat those symptoms changes her life. And so we have to be open to that. Kat. Do Dr. Karen, I have a question. Is, it, it, do you know of any research being done with patients that may have tested positive for a genetic predisposition. Is, do you think it would be worth looking at some of those women and using HRT as a, as a uh, protective or a, a preventative? I mean, is anybody doing that? Oh, no, I, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I mean, that would be great if they were, um, but I, I suspect that it would be, um, 
uh, you'd have to have really big numbers because I think that it's not it's not going to be a perfectly you know direct effect. And how much you give somebody and how you give it to them, um, it's tough. There are risks to hormone replacement therapy. There's risks to birth control pills. Um, and so we probably as a, I think that the only way we're going to get that data is if we continue to collect, um, you know, retrospective data where people, you know, give their history and say, I was on birth control pills for this many years, or I, and to collect that. And I don't know if anybody's, I mean, somebody must've done it because I have this information about reducing risk, depending on how long you've had menopause, how long you've had a fertile life cycle, there must be somebody who's collecting this data. Um, it would be certainly the Fox Insight, it would be something we could make a suggestion for them to look at some of this, this information around women's health. Um, they've got all these people in the study. And so, you know, it's, it's easy for them to call the data and, and come up with some, you know, if we're asking the question, they probably could come up with some information based on um, retrospective data. Yeah. We're working on that, right, Gaynor? We are. There seems to be some research out there, but it, the, the numbers, you know, you're right, it's so limited, yeah. the, the numbers of people in the samples. Um, the, the first time I'd kind of heard anything about estrogen having a positive effect was there was a, a doctor's letter that I came across, you know, a, like an agony aunt uh, a magazine doctor, and a woman in her 70s had written in and she was on HRT patches and she peeled the patch off and a tremor began. So she put the batch patch back on and the tremor went away. Um, and that was enough to kind of think, oh, maybe there's something in this. And then uh, a couple of years ago, there was a, an event in England called Parkinson's Eve. Um, and I was, I was uh, talking at, at that and there was this murmur across the audience where I said, you know, time of the month, do you find your meds don't work? And suddenly there was this, blah, 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 you know, a little bit of a, oh, ah, no, they don't. They don't. And that, that seemed to kind of get people on that train of thought, certainly in the UK a little bit, which is kind yeah. of, you know, yeah. interesting. Any kind of hormone therapy is going to alter how the liver functions and, and, and how and what kind of transports there is between the getting um, the uh, medications around your body and stuff like that. So, you know, it could be that hormone, that hormone replacement therapy or estrogen therapy, birth control pills change the metabolism of, of a carbidopa levodopa. I don't know if it yeah. does not, but it's, and I've not seen anybody report that, but it certainly can affect drugs interact all the time. So um, it could affect you know, how it gets metabolized, where either your Parkinson's medication is working better or, or it's, it's, or it's not because of your hormone therapy. So, yeah, sure. Um, well, well, while we're on that, I'm just going to ask this question since it's related to what we were just talking about. Um, so, uh, someone says, does Dr. Karen or other panelists have an opinion or experience with natural progesterone cream use during perimenopause or for menopausal symptoms and its possible effects on Parkinson's. Um, anything around progesterone? Well, progesterone cream, it works very well for people with menopausal symptoms. Um, and um, there's not a lot of work that's done on it because they're when they're compounded by compounding pharmacies, everybody has their own little um, recipe or whatever, but it is fairly safe to use. And, it, and it's surprisingly, you'd think that people would you know, need the estrogen. But in, in, when I was working, many, many of my patients used progesterone creams in terms of how it, how it, um, so it would even out their cycles, it would even out their moods. Um, and, uh, and they just would feel better. I don't know of any research that's been done in terms of Parkinson's disease and, and progesterone at all. Um, I haven't, I didn't see any mention of progesterone in any of the literature that I looked at. So it mean, what this is going to take is for us to, for those of us who have um, physicians who are interested, probably female physicians, is to have them, you know, have these conversations, maybe bring a panel together of, of neurologists who care about these issues and women's health, you know, advocates uh, to come and try to start brainstorming about how, how hormones really do affect um, women's, you know, this time period in their lives. There was, a, there was also a report that was saying at some point about, um, Sonia, you might have to help me on this. I, I, I sent you, we, we had a discussion about it. If you 
uh, use estrogen at the perimenopausal stage, it, it has neuroprotective qualities. There, there was some, yeah, there was some, some reports that um, the timing of the hormone replacement was important as well, that if it was taken within the first five years of menopause, that it had a greater protective effect compared to if it was taken after that time period. Yeah. But I can't remember the exact study. I'd have to look that up. Yeah. And, and again, you know, we don't know how these studies are. They're just such small samples. Oh, I was just going to say, I read that, and I think their sample size was pretty small. Yes, yeah, yeah. as it is in most. Alzheimer's might, might have some data. The Alzheimer's data might be um, applicable mm -hmm. here because we're talking about neuroprotection. And, right. Um, so they might have some more to look at. For yeah. the, the non-medical non people amongst us, <laughs> Um, can you explain how how the how progesterone what progesterone does and what estrogen does? I know that's kind of probably a dumb question, but can you kind of explain what that does in a woman's body and how that impacts on possibly on on Parkinson's drugs or or the Parkinson's symptoms? <laughs> <laughs> that's a topic that you just opened up a big I know. Well, yeah, okay. the hour talking broad, about that. Broad, broad sweet. let's just talk about what what the loss of estrogen does so I mean mm. when, when we lose our estrogen we, there's plenty of tissues that are going to be missing it um our skin our bones um our our vaginas you know I mean there's just a lot of places that need it and use it to be healthy and well um so including our brains so um I think that when we lose it, it's, it's, it's a big loss. Progesterone, it doesn't kind of sort of create that, you need it to balance out the progesterone, especially in a situation where somebody still has a uterus um, and too much estrogen can cause problems and linings to grow and cancers to develop and things like that. So the progesterone doesn't carry as much of a, of a role in, in the good things that hormone replacement therapy brings. It kind of sort of is the balancer and makes sure that, um, that it's, everything is in the right uh, quantity. So uh, that, that's the short answer to a very, you oh, know, that was good. Question. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, does anyone here use progesterone gel or, or use, no? See, I, I have found, this is my own experiment and huge caveat here, here not to be endorsed, all that, that, you know, all the warnings about um, uh, breast cancer, etc, etc. But occasionally, <laughs> I do use um, estrogen gel and it does oh, seem Estrogen or progesterone? You, you said progesterone. Estrogen gel, estrogen yeah. gel. Um, I've got one here somewhere. Estrogen. Yeah. So they, they just rub it on the skin. Um, and it does seem to, when, when, my, when, when nothing seems to be working, you know, when I'm really at my, my parky worst and very rigid, it does seem to kickstart things a little bit. Hmm. A lot. And in England, can you get that over the counter? Uh, it, it, I get it on prescription, but um, I'm not sure if you can get it over the counter or not. Okay. I am possibly supposed to take it with progesterone as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I was, I was, was going to say that, but <laughs> like I said, I'm not a, I'm not a working physician anymore, so I, I don't want to give any. Exactly. This is just a friend's chat. <laughs> We'd like to encourage everybody to take things as prescribed. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, th I think it's really interesting though, Gainer, because uh, what you just said kind of raises the, the spotlight again on the fact that we just don't know enough. You know, that should be a very easy question for us to answer. And, the, you know, people in the chat are putting questions about estrogen and progesterone. That, that should be an easy thing to answer, considering there are so many women affected by Parkinson's, yet we don't know. So yeah, I think that's that's the real issue here is why don't we know <laughs> or if we don't know, we need to do something so that we do. Well, that's it. And, and I was just kind of told, well, look at HRT. And this was just going to be there's your HRT without seeing, you know, what levels I had going on personally to work out. Well, this is the specific mix that you need, the blend, if you like. Sonia, I, I, I'm curious to hear from you. You've, you've been at this longer than any of us. It, it must be frustrating to not have more out in the literature. It's, it's not so much frustrating as it is um, surprising to me 
you know, just not understanding. And, and, and I'm, I'm partly to blame because I've been at this advocacy piece for a long time, but it's not only until recently that I realized that, wow, you know, I, I should know the answer to these questions, but looking in the literature, I can't find the answers to these common, common questions. Um, so I guess, you know, now that we know there's an issue, we can address it. So I, I think it, it'll happen. But, you know, I wonder, I think part of it um, we alluded to earlier is the fact that as women, we often don't take care of ourselves. We often take care of others before that. So we don't put a, prioritize our own issues. And I think it's also to do the fact that we didn't make our neurologists aware that, that, that it was an issue, either because we didn't know it was an issue, meaning we weren't uh, sort of aware that it was cycling with our, with our hormones, or we didn't feel we could address those issues for, for that, for, you know, whatever reason, stigma. And it wasn't asked about. It wasn't also. asked about. I think, yeah. I think if maybe we can start to raise some awareness, so at least the question is asked, then right. maybe we can get some meaningful, at least data. But right. it's up to both sides to bring it up, isn't it? So it, it's, you know, we, we, this follows on from, you know, hiding your condition in the beginning and, and, and the stigma of it as well, that if we don't talk about it, how are they going to know to ask about it? Yeah. You know, it, it, it all, it's all part of the same mix, really. That's very true. I think we need to ask about, they need to ask us about it. We need to mention it. And we also have to have answers, meaning research to back up what they give us in terms of their answer to our questions. Yeah, absolutely. The other side, of course, of, of the, 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 the hormones and how they, um, menopause, et cetera, how it affects women is body image. So you're already dealing with, with Parkinson's, which is going to have an impact on your body image. And then the menopause and, you know, suddenly gray hair, spotty, sweaty, all kinds of, you know, basically the, the sexiest thing you've ever seen on two legs. But um, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, it's a nightmare, isn't it? And body image, because you feel bad enough and the temptation to, to stay in or just put far too much makeup on to make yourself try and feel better where any, any way of getting around it really. Um, so thoughts on body image, please, Karen. Yeah, I, I've struggled with this myself. I, I have compulsive eating issues from the medication and I've gained 30 pounds since I was diagnosed. Um, you know, I've gone from like a size two to a size 12 in a really short period of time. I don't know how much of that is the medication and compulsive eating, how much of it is just perimenopausal, aging. And I exercise more than I ever have because that's important for Parkinson's. But, you know, especially with the changes about sexuality at this time in life also, I found that very, very difficult. And I'm a newlywed, I got married in August. You know, my husband mm -hmm. probably wants to have sex all the time, every day. And I'm like, oh. You know, I just, I'm, I'm aging and I have to, I, I would like to know, I mean, aside from Parkinson's, I'd just like to know more about that in general. How do we as women stay interested and excited about our sexuality and our bodies as we get older and change? So, Sonia, should I tell them about the play? I was just going to say, Karen, tell them about the play. <laughs> So as, as a gynecologist, I will tell you that, you know, I saw women day in and day out, day, going through menopause, they could have cared less if they ever had sex again. Their husband wants to have sex, they don't want to. I mean, the tricks that we would have to, they will all come in wanting a magic pill. And I didn't have one to give them because I needed one too. Um, and so when I got Parkinson's disease, I was put on uh, one of the uh, dopamine agonists. And with some mild warnings to look out for certain things and, you know, shopping, you know, addictions, whatever, compulsions. And within three months, I had a libido the size of Montana. And, and I, all of a sudden the tables were turned. My husband couldn't keep up with me. He had to go on, he had to take Yohimba bark and maca root and nothing was working. I mean, it was crazy. And it, it felt, at some point it felt like a curse because you know, he, it, he was exhausted and he was, he couldn't keep up with me. I mean, I was just, I mean, the, the first time he, it happened and he said, do you want a full round? I'm like, no, yes, 
yes, yes, uh, yes. And it was kept being yes. And it was, so we ended up writing a play. It's called Side Effects May Include. And it was a one man show. It was on off Broadway uh, two years ago. And um, it was a lovely, lovely, lovely one man show of a, of a guy who's a stand up comedian, which my husband is, who's married to a woman who's an OBGYN. It was not our name. So I could hide behind the, 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 the idea that it was not really me and what and how it impacted their lives. And, um, and how for that short period of time, he got to see what I went through and I got to see what he was going through. And, you know, at some point my medications leveled out and it, I didn't actually go off of them, but it, um, it, uh, it calmed itself down probably when I got through a little bit more through menopause or whatever. And now it's back to kind of sort of normal. Uh, there is a delightful, if, I don't know if any of you guys watch the, um, or listen uh, to read the column in the Sunday Times, um, what's it called? Um, the, uh, the column that, oh, why can't I think of what it's called? I'll think of what it is. It's, it's a, um, it's a, some of you know what it is? Uh, it's Modern Love. Thank you, Lori, who just <laughs> answered it. It's called Modern Love. And he actually had a column, he had a, a, his column accepted. And he was one of the ones that was the first ones to actually create a, a, an audio live version of it. And it's really lovely. The guy who reads it is really great. So that's, that was done by WBUR in Boston, NPR station, and Modern Love, Mark Jaffe. And it's, um, it's, it's a good piece. I recommend it. Uh, it's funny and it's touching. And, um, and so it's, it's an issue for many, many women. And it's an issue for many, you know, I mean, the funny thing about the, the, one of the points that Mark made was that because I was hiding my Parkinson's disease, he couldn't tell anybody. So he couldn't tell anybody that he was having this really great time. He couldn't tell all of his buddies because they didn't know that I had Parkinson's disease. And so he couldn't even joke about it on stage because people would know that I had Parkinson's disease. So he had to keep it secret the whole time. Um, so anyway, there's a flip side to that. And that is that, you know, you can, sometimes people's medications are, you know, causing good problems, I guess you would say. Um, he was happy, but exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was glad to be back in the club for a while. So, um, yeah. I, I used to share with my patients in clinic that 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 often for women to have everything go right sexually it's like an air traffic control panel thousands of knobs and dials you know things have got to be good with the kids the lighting's got to be right they've got to be having a good hair day feel good in their pants between it's cycles so funny you say that kit because yeah. part of the, one of the line one of the, the scenes in this is where he just says that in, in order to have sex the, the temperature karen needed to you know, have a job that was successful the temperature in the house needed to be between mm -hmm. whatever the kids exactly. had to be doing well in school and the democrats had to control at least one house of congress exactly exactly and then and then what i said and for many men not all so i don't want to put everybody in boxes but it's a light switch and so you have to work together to get your panels in order and I understand that about our brains and how we're different. And so, but that's really, I'm gonna to have to watch that, Karen. My husband is a, is us doing stand-up comedy on the side. So he's got great midwife jokes. They should collaborate. I bet they've got a lot of the well, same. My husband wrote a book called Sleeping with Your Gynecologist. Ah, and I'm gonna look it up, all right? Get it on I'm learning answer. a lot. So, um, <laughs> and it, he, you know, it's just the funny stories in medicine that people tell and, and the experiences that we have uh, that can make us laugh. Um, because if you can't get through this life laughing, you know, it's a sad day. Um, but, um, you know, in terms of Parkinson's disease, you know, Karen is right. I mean, body image is a real problem. You know, when you're having a tremor that you can't control, especially maybe in the evening, or, you know, you're, you can't roll over in bed, you know, you can't, you can't move, you know, um, and, and for, especially for us women, you know, our husbands, you know, my husband say, said when we first got diagnosed and my tremor is probably the most um, is, is my pr predominant symptom. He, you know, he felt like a young teenager not knowing whether to take my hand or not. You know, do, am I gonna feel like he's trying to stop my tremor? Is he supporting me? So it's a, for them to have to kind of relearn how to be around you. Um, just there's certain things that will upset, you know, somebody like me. Um, I remember we were, um, we went to the neurologist. I don't often bring him with me because I, he'll do things like this. He'll look at the neurologist and say, so when can, when, how long can she keep driving for? And I'm like, 
what do you mean? How long can I keep driving? We didn't talk about this. And why are you asking him this? And that was the last time I brought him in. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a learning process for the, for, for the whole family. And, um, and, and, and so there's, and, and even as far out it is, I find that people, some people will ask me how I'm feeling and they genuinely ask me that. Some people will never ask me how I'm feeling. Um, and so it's, it's, everybody has a different role when you're dealing with something like this, but um, body image is when you've got symptoms, then, you know, it's, it's going to change how you feel about, about being intimate with somebody else. Yeah, I, I wanted to say one, one really big thing about body image for me has to do with the facial masking. Yeah. You know, my personality before Parkinson's was very bubbly and cheerful and I smiled a lot. I, you know, people loved my smile. They would compliment me on my smile. And I find myself sitting around most of the day unless I'm paying attention to it, very serious. And, you know, even some people think I'm angry or I'm not friendly or, you know, I'm too serious and, and I'm none of those things. I'm very friendly and I'm not upset. And I just have that facial mask a lot of the time. And I find that difficult with body image. Um, Karen, this was, uh, somebody asked a question and it's not about hormones and stuff, but I think it might be relevant right now. And also you, uh, you're a newlywed. So I don't, were you, um, were you, uh, did you get Parkinson's after you met your husband or before? Yes, actually, um, we had been dating for four or five years. We moved in together and decided to buy a house together. And six months later, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and lost my career. Okay. So that just was, whoa, you know, I mean, it, and we had never really planned to get married, actually. We'd both been married before and we had a very uh, sterile financial relationship in terms of like how we shared assets and things like that. And uh, after getting Parkinson's and honestly, the pandemic, I mean, we were shut in together in a house and we were living together then by about three years. And uh, we decided we did want to get married. And that's the, the type of love that we had. And, and um, you know, it, it was a very moving thing for me. And one of the things we said in, in our vows, which I thought was really beautiful was, uh, you know, one of the lines in our vows was that I will hold you when you're healthy and I will hold you when you're not, you know, and um, it's, it's not just that physical holding, but holding space for you through time. And I think getting married in the latter half of your life, I, I've been married before, but this is by far the love of my life. And, you know, I don't want to be a burden to him in any way. And I'm sure he feels the same, but, you know, our relationship is, a, you know, deep and true love. And it's just, I feel so lucky to have that at this time, you know. Yeah. Somebody asked, you know, could you discuss about when you're dating, if you're dating somebody, when's the best time to tell someone you have Parkinson's? Um, and I would say this is probably true for people who aren't really outward manifesting uh, lots of motor symptoms. So the, the topic doesn't come up, but would be curious to to get some, you know, this is, this sort of revolves around that body image and that feeling of, oh, you know, are you going to still want me? Am I going to still be desirable? All of those things. Would anybody have anything to say to our guests who asked that question? I, I haven't been dating with Parkinson's. My husband and I have been married for 31 years, but I, I really believe that open and honest communication is really important. And the foundation from which we've been able to weather 31 years of marriage and raising three kids. And um, I believe that, that human beings are complex. And, um, and if you're gonna find a life partner, being comfortable in your own shoes is probably one of the most beautiful things, whether you're, um, you have Parkinson's, whether you have acne, whether you have static clean, whether you've got crooked teeth, I mean, I think we all carry challenges and I think how we carry them and when we're honest with ourselves that that can be so hugely attractive to other people. So um, I can't speak, I'm not walking in somebody else's shoes, but I really believe that that's been the key to our success long-term. And I'd love to see people be able to be comfortable um, with all the parts of themselves and share that with somebody else. That's my two cents. Yeah, and I couldn't agree with you more. And this, but some of it, some of it is to also is to 
expect more from our movement disorder specialists so that when we first get diagnosed, we walk out without feeling stigmatized by this disease. You know, and, and it's how we look at it. I remember when I first started telling people, I was like, oh, I have something to tell you. And, and I ended up having to console them. And, and so when you, when, you, when you tell people, I have Parkinson's disease and I'm doing well, you can then start a discussion from a different point of view than, than oh my God, I have Parkinson's disease. Um, and so, you know, there's, there has to be some retraining of, of the medical professional professions who are, who to some degree, you know, they don't want to have to tell you. I just, I just had my annual exam with my, with my physician today, not my neurologist, my general. And he said that he has a hard time telling people that they have Parkinson's disease. I said, why? Why? I mean, somebody's got to tell them. So here's an opportunity for you to partner with that person, make sure that when they leave, they understand that, that there's lots out there to help them. And there, because there is lots, I mean, there, all of this stuff that we're doing now is advocacy work that wasn't being done 20 years ago. I'm sure Sonia, when she was first diagnosed, had nothing to turn to. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Karen. I think also we have to recognize that we're more than this disease. You know, Absolutely. if you were to ask a dozen people who don't know you or who know you, you know, from afar, they're not gonna say, oh, Parkinson's patient, oh, somebody who's got a disability. They're gonna say, she's a mother, she's a friend, she's a colleague, she's a, a sister, you know, she's a daughter. We are much more than what we define as ourselves when it comes to this disease. And we have to recognize that and rejoice in that. And like Kat was saying, accept that, accept that. And it, it's gonna be a part of your life. For now, we don't have a cure, just for now. You know, that time is coming soon as well, hopefully. But um, you know, we, we have to recognize that this is part of us and it's not all of us, but it is part of us. And to be honest with the partner that you're with, you want them to be the type of person that would be accepting of that and recognize that this is not a doom and gloom diagnosis for, for, for you and that you, you are much more than your disease and be, be available to be there to support you through it as you would be there to support them. I think it saves a lot of time, doesn't it, Sonia? Yeah. <laughs> I've got Parkinson's, right, okay, if they've gone out the bathroom window. Yes, then they, they <laughs> weren't. Point, yeah. They weren't the person for you anyway. Time, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> they weren't there for you, for sure. Yeah. I told my other half, um, we, we knew each other back kind of 20 years beforehand. We met up um, in a pub and, you know, have you been, have you been at that point I was only a year post diagnosis so I didn't look as if there was anything going on um, and you know just kind of proper catch up on stuff and I had to write it down I was still at the point where I, I had to write out and then I got diagnosed with young onset Parkinson's disease and on the way home apparently he parked up his bike and had a little cry but then he kind of came back <laughs> you know he, he actually um yeah it kind of developed from there so I think it there's you know they're, they're, they're not all running out the bathroom window or squeezing through the bathroom window yeah actually uh Jackie Jackie brought up that um Heather uh she's another panelist um she's just not able to join us today but she had said in an earlier session uh let them weed you out which is great right like you you're you have to weed them out too and they're gonna weed you out and like everybody said i mean if somebody's running through the hills like thank the lord that you didn't I mean, if anybody them. came onto this panel right now they would not know what our diagnosis was mm -hmm. no. yeah. i mean if you think about talking to somebody about anything like anything that you have that's a personal thing it's all in your delivery it just if you can just say yeah, well, you know, so I have Parkinson's and I was doing, you're not going to dismiss it, but you're not pretending right. like it's this end of the world thing. Um, they're going to just, they're going to take their cues from you. Yeah, you know, I have a little bit of perspective on dating as a recovering alcoholic um, and having a, the disease of alcoholism. And, you know, when you go out on a first date, you're kind of nervous and everybody wants that social lubricant to like take a drink and, and have a date. And I never knew when to bring it up because honestly, I am so fun and funny and all these things without alcohol. I don't need that. I mean, I'm weirder than anything, you know, without alcohol. And when I would date and tell someone that I didn't drink, um, either they thought something was really wrong with me and I had this big dark secret or 
they felt uncomfortable drinking or, you know, it, it often would weed somebody out. And, and I thought, well, I don't want to be with that person, you know, um, because they wouldn't be an appropriate partner for me. But, you know, it's not Parkinson's. I've often thought if I were single and I had Parkinson's and I wanted to date, I, I might like to date someone with Parkinson's. I mean, I've met some wonderful people at boxing that it, how nice would it be just to not have to uh, explain anything and to just be there for that person. But, you know, that's not always an answer either uh, for people, but I don't know if that's helpful perspective or not, but maybe we need to run an online PD dating line that you know, you can join I want to be the matchmaker. <laughs> the farmers have it. We can have it. You know, farming you dating. Can. I love it. It's, it's not uncommon. It's, it's there, there's quite a few that get together. Maybe it's just a, a, a dating room, a speed dating room or a, whatever, the uh, uh, WPC, wouldn't that be funny? Oh. That's <laughs> speed dating. Move around, move. <laughs> I can't, I'm off. <laughs> you just pretend that I like him, I'm staying. Yeah, <laughs> Parkland is the perfect city for that. Yeah, we haven't solved any research issues, but we're gonna ha be making a lot of- Yeah, but we, we come up with an event. <laughs> Trudy says, but if you swipe left, but have dyskinesias. <laughs> 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 um, Gaynor, are there any other questions that you want to ask from, from, our, from our list or anybody else have a, a last, a final question from the audience that would like to chime in and ask something? If not, we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up. I think we've covered everything on the list, Mel, unless you can. Okay, great. Well, um, thank you so much, Dr. Karen Jaffe, for being our guest today. It was really My wonderful pleasure. to have you. And thanks to Karen and Gaynor and Sonia and Kat for being here today. Super uh, appreciative of that. We are going to be talking about contraception and pregnancy uh, next month. So if that's interesting to you, please be sure to uh, watch that. And you'll get the recording, the video, the audio, and the transcript. So thank you so much for all being here. And we look forward to seeing you next month. Bye-bye. <laughs>